I'm Claire Hubble, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss Moscow's threat of World War III if Ukraine is admitted to NATO, and delve into the Ramstein Group's pledge to boost Ukraine's missile defense. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Ukraine can win, Ukraine must win, and Ukraine will win. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Thursday, the 13th of October, day 232. And today I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols and later on, senior reporter Roland Oliphant. I started off by asking Dom for military developments over the past 24 hours. Hi, Claire. Hi, everybody. Um, it's been, uh, it's continued to be busy across the theatre of Ukraine. Russia, the strikes have continued in the Kyiv region, um, in Mykolaiv to the south and Zaporizhia to the south. Uh, loss of civilian life again. Um, They've also claimed, Russia claims they've taken two villages uh, south of the village, of, of the sorry, of the city of Bakhmut in the in the Donbass. So this is a city right in the centre that the Wagner group have been um, attacking for, for quite some weeks now, uh, making small gains back to, remember a couple of months ago we were talking about sort of one kilometre a week type thing. That seems to be the the rate of advance that they are managing. Roland joined us yesterday and spoke from the area and said that it's very much weather dependent there. So on 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 clear days, the, the drones can go up and then there's a lot of uh, artillery duels. Uh, on less good days, as as was yesterday, um, then there it was much quieter. But it does seem to be it's still a very a very active front there in the uh, in the Donbass. Um, elsewhere, down in the south in Hezon region. The uh, message today from the UK Defence Intelligence is saying that the, the, after the... Sorry, let me go back a step. So a couple of weeks now, there's been... Um, there was a breakthrough by Ukrainian forces in the Hezon region. They've been pushing. We've likened it to a sort of giant Jenga block. They were pushing there to see where the weak points were and then reinforcing those those areas where they were having more success. They found a measure of success going down the Dnipro River. So... Um, looking looking north, if you like, if you, from, from the Russians' perspective, their right flank, um, the, this area of the of, um, Hazon uh, Oblast that is north and west of the Dnipro River, where we think there's five, six, seven thousand ish Russian soldiers, obviously in the city of of um, Hazon as well, but across that region. Ukraine started a, a a combined arms attack there some months ago. Combined arms being a sort of very deliberate. Um, infantry with armor, with engineers, with electronic warfare, with drones, artillery, all the rest of it, all the all the various parts of the military uh, playbook, as opposed to the the sort of pell mell dash that we saw around around Kharkiv a couple of weeks uh, before that, so about six weeks ago. So they've been pushing in heads on. They found a measure of success coming down the Dnipro River, so the the, the Russians' right flank, the sort of eastern flank, if you like, and uh, UK defense intelligence is, today is saying that that flank sort of collapsed back. The Russian retreat fell back about 20 kilometres over the last couple of weeks. So they fell back 20 kilometres. They are now attempting to consolidate a new front line um, based around the city of Milove, which is on the on the river. Uh, and a line west from there uh, is it, it seems to be the new front line. However, it is it is also very active. Um, and the, the west of that line, which before when the Russian forces were slightly further north, um, the western end of that line seemed to be seemed to be, seemed to run into the Inilitz River. So in that in that little blob of the Hezon Oblast, north and west of the Dnipro River, um, that little section that was that had been taken by Russian forces, right in the middle of that is the Inilitz River, not no, nowhere as deep or wide as the Dnipro, but still a significant geographic obstacle that runs north to south, with the southern end sort of trickling into the the eastern outskirts of Hezon City itself. So that was forming a the the, the sort of western end of the line since russia have fallen back 20 k's uk defense intelligence are suggesting that 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 end of the flank that western end of that new front line is no longer protected by the inlets river because it all gets a bit the geography gets a bit scrappy around there and and as i say things are are in a certain state of flux so um still very 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 fluid in in that area um, they also say that most Russian forces in that area are um, under strength VDV. So VDV is a Russian airborne forces. So, you know, some of their better troops. However, they've been there for a long time. Uh, I mean, bear in mind, yeah, this this war's been going on for nearly eight months now. So some of these people have been in the field 
uh, fighting for that time. And of course, they were there for a lot longer than that. They were positioned for months before that. So some of these people would have been in the field for um, yeah, possibly a year. So never mind your battlefield discipline, or rather as good as your battlefield discipline is, if you're in the field for a year, it's going to take its toll. Um, add to that that the UK uh, DI, Defence Intelligence, is saying that this is, these are understrength units. Um, so that it, it, what they make up for in... in uh, in quality, they might they might start. Um, that, that you can probably take some of that away in the in the quality that's that's left. Um, and the, the the assessment there is that they think that Ru- Russia is probably preparing for um, combat in the city itself. Now, two things on that. Firstly, I'd be very surprised if Ukraine wants to try and get into the city anytime soon. Urban combat is is much more. It's much harder than, than than combat out in in rural areas. The the ratios of attacking forces, which we normally say is kind of three three to one, the attacker needs three to one advantage in a in a sort of typical uh, rural setting. That that goes up. I mean, crikey, at least double that, if not you know seven eight nine to one. You really need for an ur- for an urban environment because uh, just because of the nature of fighting in in towns and cities. Um, so I'd be surprised if if Ukraine tried to do that initially. Um, I, I, I this side of winter but if these assessments and of course they are sprinkled with lots of likelies and thought to be and, and what have you that's the nature of intelligence there is no, there are no definites here they they will use phrases like probably and and highly likely and so on and so forth um so we should never look for definites from these guys but uh, they're saying they're likely anticipated russia is likely anticipating combat in the in the in Kherson city Kherson city which indicates that they are expecting their line out out in the rural area to, to collapse further and come back to the city um obviously one one for the future we'll, we'll watch this as it as it carries on but um it speaks of a continued slow um rate of advance by ukraine in that southern in the southern flank there uh, which we've been talking about for a little while other stuff to talk about today um the second day of of the um of the meeting in in NATO headquarters in Brussels is going on, which uh, I'll talk about in a moment about what the latest uh, weapons pledges that's come out of the Ramstein Six meeting. That's the Ukraine Defence Contact Group, um, known as Ramstein, the Ramstein um, Group, because it was the first one happened in the US Air Base in Germany in Ramstein in Germany. Lloyd Austin, US Secretary of Defence, hosting it. Um, so I'll come back to that in a little moment, but um, I'll give you uh, a pause there. Thanks for that, Dom. So as you've touched on there, the biggest news so far today really is uh, that Russia is preparing to evacuate Herzon after Ukraine pushed ahead with its counteroffensive. I'm just wondering for our listeners who might not be familiar, what's the significance of the Herzon region and why is it so important to Ukraine's military strategy? Uh, well, so has on it's uh, it's down the south of the country it uh, it borders the sea of azov which is that the, the little um the, the part of the the northeast portion of the of the black sea um and also the the black sea proper the other side of, of crimea um so it's important because it was the first major city probably only, the only major city taken by russia since february the 24th it is the regional capital um so there's symbolic value attached there to, to hold her to if they if Russia was pushed back out of such a major a major city, also having got across the Dnipro River, which is quite a, a significant geographic boundary, if they get pushed back, then it's very very difficult to 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 you know to to push back again. So so once these big geographic boundaries of of uh, uh, seas, rivers, mountains, once you are once it's disadvantageous to you, once you're the wrong side of it from your point of view, it's it's extremely difficult to get to get the other side. So Ukraine have, have wanted to take this back, obviously since uh, since the day it was it was taken. They've had a had a campaign of dropping the bridges or attacking the bridges and the dam, which is on the Dnipro, which can um, uh, which can reinforce the Russian troops north and west of the river in that little lozenge around Kherson city itself. Um, now the bridges, if they've not I mean, they are passable to traffic, but, you know, you wouldn't want to put a heavy... Uh, it's impassable to heavy military traffic. So civilian traffic, and possibly not even that, judging by the state of some of those bridges, the Antonovsky Bridge near near Hezon City itself. Um, Russia has been using uh, a sort of pontoon system they've, they've jacked up over the river, which uh, which can work. I mean, that is a that is an engineering task, military engineering task, but it's, it's very slow. 
pretty unwieldy. It's a nice target in and of itself. So it, they are hanging on north and west. We think, I mean, some weeks ago, there were reports that the the commanding elements of those Russian forces had been brought back south of the river for their own security. They can obviously still exercise command from from the south. It's not ideal because you don't you don't get to uh, sort of sniff the wind in, in the expression. Um, so the commanders are relying on good communications and reliable, honest, open, accurate reporting from their subordinates. None of that we've seen particularly from this from the Russian army. Um, so there, there is some there has been some movement south, um, but we think. Although it would make military sense now for the for the remainder of the Russian forces to pull back to the south to regroup, reconstitute, and maybe go again, either this side of winter or, or in the spring, we think there's political uh, imperative from Putin directly um, saying that that Hezon City is not to be given up because it would be such a symbolic um, symbolic act. Of course, not forgetting the reason they want this is Putin's always wanted his land corridor from Russia down to Crimea, but he's also wanted to push further west. Um, he wants to take the town of Mykolaiv, continue down the coast to take the city of Odessa. Um, and if he were to take the, the whole of the um, the area of Ukraine that borders the Black Sea, then that that uh, that, that helps helps meet his aim of denying Ukraine its uh, any viability as a, as an economically independent um, uh, sovereign state. So if they don't have if Ukraine does not have access to the Black Sea to, to trade, then it just, you know, the economy will be absolutely smashed. So Putin's always wanted to, to take the, the land all the way through to to Odessa, possibly even further into Moldova. Um, that is simply off the cards at the moment. I mean, they, they are barely hanging on in Herzon. The idea of them pushing forward from there is, is fanciful at the moment. Never say never. Uh, fanciful at the moment. But... They are in no position to do anything right now. They are they are just about hanging on. And whilst, as I say, it would make military military sense to pull back and um, regroup and uh, reconstitute themselves and rest their their very tired fighters and equipment, there it doesn't seem that that's that that's um, going to happen anytime soon. Uh, but the the one thing that we, I mean, it's right in the middle. So in the it borders uh, Zaporizhia, and of course you've got that Zaporizhia has been. Has been very heavily shelled in the last few days. That seems to be bearing the brunt of the um, the missile attacks that Russia has been launching in the last seventy two hours ish, ninety six hours after the the Kirsch Bridge strike. Um, a lot of civilian casualties in Zaporizhia, and of course, just just down from uh, close to the heads on down from Zaporizhia city itself, you have the nuclear power plant uh, at, um, just on, on the river. So it's, it's, a, it's a very volatile region. It's it's um, there's a lot of there's a lot at stake for both sides here. Um, neither want to um, give any ground whatsoever. I mean, not, not that anyone ever wants to do that, but it, whilst it might make military sense for um, in certain scenarios, neither look neither side looks looks likely at all to to concede any of that. And as I say, right in the middle of it, you've got a nuclear power stations. So so that just sort of adds to the the difficulty in conducting military operations in this area. There has been a lot of speculation that Ukraine is heading south towards Crimea and will attempt to retake Crimea. Is it fair to say we can assume that's going to be Ukraine's next move? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think so. Um, in terms of next moves, um, no, I think. I, I mean, they've got a long way to go before they can um, have any decisive military effects. In Crimea, I think. Um, now I'm, I'm I'm pausing because you you don't necessarily have to be there to threaten it. If you threaten the the approaches to it, the Kirsch Bridge and then the the road, the the land the land corridor, um, then that that will focus mines, focus Russian mines in and of itself. Uh, we have obviously seen strikes in Crimea, the Saki Air Base, um, and others in in the last few uh, last few weeks. Now, President Zelensky has said that, he, that you know, he's going to. He, his aim is to push Russia out of of every piece of Ukrainian territory. So Crimea is central to that. Crimea is loaded with symbolism and uh, and political meaning. So I think that it it will be uh, on Ukraine's definitely on their on their you know, priority list. But I think right now it um, it would not be a, their their next move. Um, I think they're going to try to to 
to maybe take one one more big push before the winter freezes everything in they would be delighted to be able to push russian forces out of the uh, the, the area of hezon uh, oblast that, that that they have um and that in and of itself would would pile the pressure on russian forces in crimea but it but it's still too soon to start talking about any kind of joined up military operation to um to retake crimea Thanks for that, Dom. And I'll let you take a pause there as we've been joined by uh, Celia Forum correspondent Roland Oliphant, who is in Zaporizhia. Roland, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing um, and who you've been speaking to over the last few days? So uh, I've I've just been speaking actually to um, a couple who've just managed to get out of occupied territory. So Zaporizhia, um, just to set the scene for where I am, is a city on the the, the bend of the Dnipro River. It's about 20, 30 miles, um, at a guess, maybe a bit more from the de facto front line. It's, you'll have heard about it because of the nuclear plant. You'll have heard about it because of the um, kind of blitz-like strikes on uh, residential buildings here over the past week. Um, but it's also important because uh this is the only place you can cross the lines um so in any war kind of life has a weird way of continuing and despite there being front lines there are ways across and trade continues people get out the only kind of official um green corridor between occupied territory and ukrainian held territory um is just south of zaporizhia at a place called um vasilivka um now, this was, I, I kind of came here because I was, I was interested in what was going on here. I, I, I heard talk about this guy, this kind of, uh, did you see The Third Man? Remember The Third Man, that, that wonderful old movie about, you know, a slightly dodgy chap in post-war Vienna? You know, I, I'd, I'd heard talk about kind of Harry Limeish kind of guys, right? You know, people who've worked out how to do business both sides, going back and forth, you know, greasing the wheels with some cigarettes for soldiers here and there, Um and that kind of fascinated me. Um, and I haven't found that guy. The thing is that that whole flow of people has really slowed down since the referendums last week because it turns out the Russians have decided, well, now we've had a referendum. This checkpoint is now the state border of the Russian Federation. Um, so when you had people coming back and forth um, to see family, some people deciding to leave, some people would come here and go back um, quite frequently over the months um, over you know previous this month since the war began um, it's now become incredibly difficult to get out so I've just spoken to a couple Victor and Luba I'll withhold their surnames um, they were queuing for 14 days one four days just waiting um, to get across I mean they, they they lived close enough to the queue to kind of go home and sleep at night um, they said it's 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 become incredibly um obstructive basically it's a, the russians aren't saying anything about why it suddenly become obstructive but as soon as that referendum happened suddenly they were demanding more bits of paperwork they were checking everything they were suddenly making everybody take stuff out of the boot of the car and 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 they said well look they they're not explaining it but but the message we get is they're just trying to make it difficult for people to leave they don't want people to leave they want to keep as many people there as possible and another interesting thing they said is that, you know, we got out. I mean, they weren't that interested in us. We're old. Oh, these, these guys are in their late 50s. Um, they came through in a group, I think, of about 14 cars, which is much less than the flow that you'd get um, previously. Um, two of those cars were sent back. And they say because they had staff members from the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Um, so the word is, if you are working... If you're one of the staff from Energodar who works in the nuclear plant, you need special permission from Rosatom, that's the Russian nuclear monopoly, to leave. So they're doing everything they can to keep those people there um, and everything they can to keep as many people in uh, in Kherson region and, and, and Zaporizhia region as possible um, to prevent this, uh, this flow of people coming out. Um, so that's the that's a little bit of reporting i've just um just managed to do in time in time for the um for the podcast um i've always had some some fairly interesting conversations with the uh, uh with, with the emergency services here um about you know 
how you get people um, out of bombed out buildings and rubble and, um, you know, kind of dealing with these London blitzish uh, situations um, of which there are several around the city after these missile strikes over, uh, over the past week. Thanks for that, Roland. Could you explain what the benefit is of keeping people in the city? Why would Russia want to do that? I mean, I think I think for one thing, they've been losing a lot of population. When you annex a territory, it's you don't want to lose your workers. You don't want to lose the people who make, um, you, you know, the, the, the economically active stuff. There's no point in having a an, an empty an empty town and an an empty region. Um, I mean, you know, we famously remember that's, that's basically why the Berlin wall was built, right? It was to stop people leaving. Um, and there has been a large outflow of people. Um, I think especially since this referendum, I mean, the referendum's interesting. The guys I was just speaking to, they said, you know, we stayed partly because we just, we kept on thinking we're going to be liberated. You know, the Ukrainians are going to come back. The Ukrainians are coming back. They said that the the referendum was the last straw because they realised the Russians intended to stay, um, and they didn't want to get. They got scared, and and they began to think, what else is going to happen here? So you had people, you know, trying to get out. The Russians seemed to be fed up with that. Um, I think largely for for you know kind of economic reasons that the the they said they got this. You know, it wasn't spelt out explicitly, but the kind of remarks that the the FSB people and the Russian soldiers were saying on the checkpoints on the other side kind of made clear, you know, we think this is Russia and, and you're fleeing Russia and we're not very happy with that. Um, and the other thing, that that's in general. Um, and I think it's quite it's quite clear why they don't want employees of the Saprigia MPP leaving because they need qualified people to run that nuclear plant. Thank you for that. Um, as you've just mentioned there, you have been out and about sort of seeing the, the uh, repercussions of the destruction rained down by Russia. Could you kind of explain what you've seen uh, around Zaporizhia, please? Yeah, so Zaporizhia is not by any means a frontline city. I mean, the, the, the front line is several tens of miles um, outside, but it is the capital of one of the regions that, that Russia has tried to annex. And the front has kind of stabilised since the beginning of the war, I mean, since kind of early March, the line had already stabilized um, around here, kind of left to right um, uh, uh, along the oblast, kind of anchored to the river um, on the western side, the western end of that line. Um, so it's not a city that's been pounded by by grad rockets and artillery and that kind of thing. It's not, not like Bakhmut, which I was talking about yesterday. Um, but for some reason, over the past week or so, it has had several cruise missile strikes, um, kind of relentless, and some of them really bloody, you know, kind of tens of people killed um, by these things that have fallen. We were just driving around, kind of having, having a look at it. Um, very normal city, people going about, and then, you know, there on the main highway, uh, center of town, main central street, there's just a large apartment block that's just sheared in half, um, simply sheared in half, you know, four or five floors, um, everything exposed. So there's a, you know, there's what's left of a, you know, a, a wine, a kind of whiny boutique, nice place to eat with, you know, it's advert for vegan milk um, on offer above that, somebody's flat, um, things like that. Lives, amazingly exposed like sliced through a cake um and we know you know I, I i don't have the figures of casualties to hand there i mean i believe they they kept on digging people out of that one um and and i think it got into the tens the number of people killed in that particular strike um and then you know just up the road around the corner another one um a residential apartment block again just sliced in half um, I was told by a neighbour that only four people died in that one. He said most of those flats were, thank God, empty at the time. Um, it's really not clear why they... I, I don't really get why they're suddenly hitting Zaporizhia. Part of it is this demonstrative thing about, look, um, you know, we want to scare everyone. It goes into the terror bombing and the hitting on uh, on, on Kiev. Um, why would you fire S-300 unguided, you know, missiles into the city? 
um, to blow up apartment blocks that are mostly empty or have old people in them or, or a, you know, a, a, a wine and cheese boutique. Um, I was talking to one of the neighbors um, who came out, uh, this guy who was living across the courtyard uh, from one of these places when it happened. He said, you know, I was lying in bed. It was 1.30 in the morning. I was woken up by a boom and I was counting the boom. And the first one was quite far away and the second one was closer. And I didn't for the life of me think that, you know, one of them would land right here. And it did. Uh, you know, the glass was blowing out over his bed, um, smashed up his kitchen. But he was fine. He was on the other side of the of the courtyard. But his theory, and it is, it really is a matter of kind of, you know, picking theories out of the air without being inside the heads of the Russian general staff. But he said, look, um, I, I, I did my, uh, my national service in, in the army in 1994. Um, and I've noticed that a lot of these things seem to land on places that used to belong to the military in Soviet times or in the early 90s. So he was talking about, um, he, he did his national service in 1994 in Odessa, and he said, towards the beginning of the war, um, there was a particular strike that killed a little girl. And he said, I can remember that 30 years ago, there was uh, an, an air defense base there, but it, they'd, they'd moved out kind of 30 years ago. Um, and his theory is they are chucking around missiles using extremely old maps. That was, that was his guess. Um, I, I can't see any other logic to to the kind of things I've seen. I mean, it reminded me of, you know, it reminded me of when you read about the Second World War and, and V2s and V1s kind of hitting on London. You know, it's not the Blitz because it's not, you know, carpet bombing and vast swathes of areas flattened, but it's just very powerful missiles landing without warning randomly and, and just, just extinguishing lives. Um, you know, it's very a very a very weird thing to do. Um, the last strike here was a uh, I think two or three days ago, um, but you know the, it takes a long time to to clear up. You know there's still workmen sifting through rubble. There's still firemen. There's still they're dealing with those tricky engineering questions. Right, so you've got a, a building that's been cut in half. Oh God! Well, what are we going to do with that? How do we safely remove that bit without the rest of it falling down? Um, a woman showed up while I was there kind of, you know, had to negotiate with the police and the fire service to get into her, her flat was one of the ones that abuts, you know, the wall that's being cut aside. Um, is it safe to go in there? It's probably not safe to live there, but she really needed to go and get some of her kit. Um, you know, all, all this, um, it's weird. Uh, yeah. You know, weird kind of London blitzish kind of scene. Just to change the subject slightly, uh, Dom, I'd like to go back to you about the rockets the UK has pledged to supply to Ukraine. What do we know about them and what kind of impact will they have for Ukraine's military? Yeah, so this has come out of the the Ramstein 6 meeting, as I've said, at NATO headquarters in Brussels, the uh, Ukraine Defence Contact Group, to give it its full name, uh, Secretary of Defence, US Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin hosting the meeting. Um, it was announced that yesterday, uh, or last night, in fact, that the UK is going to donate a number of AMRAAM missiles. Now, these are uh, advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles. They are uh, very fast. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty much well, brand new. The the extended range version, which we think these ones are, the AMRAAM ER extended range, they are uh, specifically used in the ground-based air defense role. So, you know, you'd, you'd guess from the title, Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air Missile, they are primarily designed to be fired from fast jets against other other things, primarily fast jets or, or missiles. But the uh, AMRAAM ER, extended range, is specifically designed for um, ground-based air defense. So to be fired from launches on the ground against incoming um, missiles, cruise missiles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, this version so the amram has been around for a while it's it's um it's various it, it is um iterations of of existing weapons but th- this version uh, was only tested last year in 2021 middle of last year um it goes at about mach 4 so yeah really fast range from the ground basis is range of about 25 kilometers although a lot of that depends on it needs to be queued by a radar um so what can the radar see if there's terrain in the way um, but at, at about 25 k's up to a, so about 50,000 feet we're not entirely not entirely sure because it's, it's it's brand new 
And these AMRAMs are, um, they will be used, they are specifically donated for use with the US um, NASAMS, the National Advanced Surface to Air Missile System, the brand new, um, the very, 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 very capable surface to air missile system. So this is all part of increasing Ukraine's air defense capability. So being able to protect uh, key sites, be it uh, military sites or, or civilian sites. It is not possible it is not designed to and not possible to to put an entire dome over ukraine and not allow not allow anything in it just simply won't work like that air defense is a game of it's not a game at all stupid language i apologize air defense is 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 where you plan little bubbles of of protection and even then something can get through you should layer these systems for the heights they can go and what they can pick up and how they work with uh, different radars and take in information and, and what have you but you need a layered layered network and even then you're it's only around certain areas so you have to decide what is most important to you what you can protect uh, and what you have to take at risk so um, that is the as we've seen from Russia's response in the last few days, what what they do, uh, all they all they seemingly can do at the moment in response to Ukrainian battlefield advances is to chuck cruise missiles and other piece, uh, bits and pieces around. So air defence is um, is coming really coming to the fore in terms of uh, in terms of priority. Um, Lloyd Austin also commended Germany for supplying um, a similar system. So again, in that layered defence. So the Iris T air defence system, so Iris infrared imaging system. So it goes against, it looks for heat signatures. In this case, it's, it's specifically designed to look for the, the heat source of a cruise missile. So the Iris T, the T is the thrust thrust vector control, so that so the missile can steer in the air. If it's going against a cruise missile that's manoeuvring, trying to avoid being hit, the um, the thrust vector means that it can it can steer the, the missile coming towards and going towards the cruise missile. So RST air defence system. Just to add to the military TLAs, the three letter abbreviations. This is the SLM variant, which is the surface launched missile. Thankfully, no more explanation needed there. So the RST SLM air defence system. It's um, it launched from the ground. Each system comes uh, three three launchers, three truck based launchers. Each launcher, we, each launcher has eight missiles, forty kilometer range for those uh, for those missiles. And then there's a separate command vehicle and a radar. The command vehicle can be twenty k's away, so, which which is to protect it. So if they if there's counter battery fire or any other fire coming in to try and destroy the launchers, you don't you won't lose all of your all of your stuff if if something gets through. Now these things are effective. Against air launched cruise missiles, such as the the KH one hundred and one cruise missile that we've seen um, throughout this throughout this war. However, what they're not good at is um, uh, going up against ballistic missiles, such as the Iskander. And we talked about this a few days ago. Ballistic missiles come in at a much higher angle because so, they go so high, they then come down very very steeply over normally over seventy degrees, which is very very steep. And they're going so fast, about two and a half miles a second. So the, the coming in very steep, very fast, it, it is extremely difficult to protect against that. And this system, the Iris, Iris T, is is not designed to um, defend against ballistic missiles. There are other systems. This is why I said you need a layered defense. Other systems to um, that are optimized for um, trying to destroy ballistic missiles. Um, but these systems from Germany, so this is the first of uh, four systems. So, so this this one's arrived. Like I say, each system consists of three uh, three trucks with missiles on board. Another three systems due to be delivered next year. These also are, are, are brand new. They were they only had their final tests uh, late last year. Um, they're not even yet in in service with the German military. So they are they are brand new, 40 kilometer range, maximum altitude of about 60,000 feet. The radar can see out to 250 k's. So you know these are these are big systems they're they're medium and long range systems and you you need to bunch them together to protect against um any uh, any threats you might think are coming towards those those key points that you want to uh, you want to defend um there are other bits and pieces that came out of Ramstein so Britain said it's also going to send hundreds of additional aerial drones an extra 18 howitzer artillery guns i'm not sure if that's 155 or 105 mil not been able to bottom that one out um but they say 18 in addition to the 64 already delivered so i've been trawling around this morning trying to find what the 64 delivered already were and whether they were 155 i think they were 155 but i will i will check on that um but yeah ramstein is still going on still going on this morning and there was actually there was an announcement this morning 
the 14 NATO allies and Finland, Finland's there in observer status, but 14 NATO allies and Finland are going to develop a European Sky Shield initiative, which is uh, basically going to attempt to um, knit together all the air defence capabilities of of, of the um, European nations led by Germany that are buying into this system. So there'll be there'll be common systems that can talk to each other and 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 share um, share information, share data in order to knit together that air defence um, protective zone for NATO. Now, interesting. I wonder if uh, as part of any post-war security guarantees for Ukraine, I wonder if Ukraine would be either either invited into that in the way that Finland have, but of course, obviously, Finland is already on its sort of short finals for NATO membership anyway. So um, that might be why they're involved. But but if this is just a system of complementary capabilities, it would be very interesting if NATO were to say to Ukraine, all right, look, you know, you're not going to join right now. Um, however, it, these are the systems we've bought. If you bought the same, they could just come and plug and play. So I wonder if that's... Um, if that's possibly a conversation for another day about future security guarantees for Ukraine, but um, but no, another another busy busy couple of days in the Ramstein process, and probably more to come today when the uh, when they all uh, when they all break. I, I just think it's interesting that it's that it's finally happened, um, and the the missile blitz um, a couple of days ago, which which caught everyone's eyes, um, you know, it does it does seem to have have produced a response. Um, from the west and i think that was there's always this every stage of this war seems to produce a new test um for the west as well as for ukraine for everybody else you know kind of are you going to respond are you going to deliver this and, and so on and, and air defense has really been it's been a tricky issue because before the war when you know we were getting all these signals that the invasion was going to happen and no one knew if it would or it wouldn't but you could tell by the kind of frantic diplomatic activity you know, people were spooked and they knew something was going to happen. At that moment, when Ukraine was, you know, preparing itself for something, the one thing above all that they were asking for was air defense. Was air defense, air defense, air defense. Anytime you spoke to a Ukrainian official, that was the, the, the thing, publicly and in privately, that they said, we are asking for a system. And I, I interviewed um, Dmitry Kuleba, the... the Ukrainian foreign ministry in in London. Um, I can't remember when was it. Was it two weeks before the war? Three weeks? Four weeks? You know, in the in that run up period before the invasion. Um, you know, I, I asked him. You know, what is it you're asking for? Air defence. That's the gap. That's what we've got to fill. So it's it, it's kind of amazing to me that it's taken it's taken six, seven, eight months of war, and and then and you know and then eagle day what do you whatever you want to call it you know vladimir putin's mad blitz on the cities before this finally happens and i i'm not i'm not entirely clear on why it's taken that long to be honest i mean i think there are lots of questions that we will discover the answers to um when this war is over when when we get into the archives and you know diplomats can speak freely and so on you know the other one is tanks, right? Why, why, why no MBTs? I know that there are all these excuses about oh, there's there's supply chains, and you know the Ukrainians know how to use T72s and and things like that. But you know, why did it take so long um, for Western governments to really heed this request for this kind of thing? I know, I know, like some things had been delivered already. You know, the Americans had promised to send the NASAMs, but they were meant to arrive, you know, over the long term. Um, the Germans had sent, you know, these, these Gepard tanks, um, but they're kind of, you know, low altitude things. Um, it's not comparable to this. So a significant shift actually in, in, in the Western position, a shift I think is partly prompted by, um, you know, apart from the obvious need to help Ukraine close its skies after that, but also the need to, um, as there always is in this war to, to kind of demonstrate, um, to the Kremlin, that the West will respond, that they won't take it lying down. And a, lo- a lot of the kind of diplomacy in this war um, has that kind of demonstrative nature. I just wanted to put a statement to you. Somebody has written to us on Twitter. Ukrainian soldiers are being trained by NATO, using NATO weapons with NATO intel in the field. Ukraine is already NATO. Putin has no connection with reality. I thought that was interesting considering the latest comments on how 
Ukraine's potential NATO membership would cause World War Three. Why is it that the official membership poses such a threat to Russia? I mean, official membership, official membership means Article 5, and it means all of NATO going to war in a conventional war against Russia in the event of an attack on Ukraine. So given that we now know very, very clearly that Russia, you know, harbored these aggressive intentions against Ukraine, um, that's one clear reason why they didn't want Ukraine anywhere near NATO. But there's there, there's a broader thing, right? And it's about it's about how the Russians how the Russian elite views NATO, um, which is not as a defensive alliance. They it's just, it's difficult to articulate this because because maybe it's not actually laid out in concrete terms in 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 a specific list of this is how we view the world. But basically, if you have conversations with these people. NATO and the European Union are one package and they represent the other, you know, the broadly, the enemy perhaps, um, who find they can be over there, but, you know, Ukraine is ours. And the moment Ukraine gets into NATO or gets into the European Union, it represents um, an intrusion into what is viewed as fundamental uh, Russian territory, basically, which is which is that that is, I think, the fundamental, deep, almost you know, psychological complex that feeds into the cause for that war. Um, and so, you know, they don't, you know, does it mean World War Three? I almost, I almost can't even answer that because you know the the the, the initial excuse for this war is like, oh, we don't want them to be in NATO. Is is just it's just been shown to be such a complete canard um that it's almost not worth worth a, like treating seriously but but it represents something you know when he talks about nato he's not necessarily talking about oh no it's part of a you know defensive alliance and it's going to have membership in brussels and blah 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 he's talking about this sense um which they take quite seriously in moscow that they are losing a chunk of their territory that's what they think is going on so I think that's what that kind of rhetoric represents. And we know that the, I, I think personally, you know, that that is the driving kind of force behind this war. Um, Vladimir Putin wanted to, as he saw it, halt that process and to regather, reestablish Russian control over a country that he considers to be rightfully and integrally part of Moscow's choose your term sphere of influence empire hinterland whatever so that's that's how i would think about that i mean i'm i'm coming to the end of this reporting trip in ukraine and i think i think what's getting me is this this sense that yes we've had a lot of there's been a lot of optimism from Ukraine and its allies following what happened over the past month in, in Kharkiv and Kherson. Um, and this sense that the, the wind is in, you know, the wind is in Ukraine's sails, um, and it's heading that way. But at the same time, you know, the, these past several days, I've noticed just how permanent, um, the current state of affairs seems to have become. So I apologize if it's slightly, depressing thought don't get lulled into the idea that this is all going to be over by christmas uh, I, I have a feeling this is still a long and, and very bloody road yet ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the telegraph to stay on top of all of our ukraine news analysis and dispatches from the ground subscribe to the telegraph you can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio you can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. Ukraine The Latest was produced today by Louisa Wells and on Twitter, Gemma Farrell.